embrace you. I thank you for navigating a, a wintry Sunday to be here today to worship the Lord in this place. God is just amazing. And, and we gather here, church, I hope not out of habit, but rather out of duty and obligation, responsibility uh, to really celebrate the Lord. Please don't look at this time as a, another appointment that I have on my schedule, but rather that it is a time to give back praise and worship to our Lord. I don't know if you've been busy this weekend. You might have been, but yesterday I was traveling around and I saw so many Santa Clauses. Big ones, small ones, skinny ones, and skinny ones. White ones, black ones. One with hair, some without hair. Some even partially dressed in the cold yesterday. I've been in New York a long time, but I would say, what's going on? I, I think what's happening is that people don't know what to do with their time during Christmas time. You know, they make plans to go to Radio City. I get that. They get, make times to go see the Rockettes. I get that. They make time to go. Every borough has a house that has, like, all the lights that paid the bills for all of Con Edison, right? I get that. And as I look at some of your buildings and offices where you work, you know, uh, and places where you live, you know, they have beautiful trees set up, and the amount of expense, it's like, you know, you go to sleep, and then you wake up the next morning, and the tree is there. Yesterday say we rode right by the, uh, uh, down here in downtown Manhattan, by the old seaport. They have a beautiful tree. I mean, where was that before? Like, three minutes ago. And it seems like people, you know, uh, are so active, and city sidewalks, busy sidewalks, you know, and, and all of that. And uh, it doesn't, it seems like they don't have enough to, so yesterday as we were, you know, acclimating back to the city because we were away, uh, you know, I'm seeing Santa Claus is on the corner and traffic. I, I didn't even go that far and then you thought I was driving to California. They were, they were everywhere. And, and I found out that that's like something that started now. It's like almost like a tradition. And what I found out, and I, I mean, I don't think I'm that like removed from reality here. But people actually do that on purpose, and they hop from bar to bar and get drunk and drunker, and, and they're doing it to raise money. Like, I might not be the brightest guy on this planet, but why not not drink and give the money? I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. I, I've gotten to the conclusion that many times people don't know what to do with themselves. And so they do this kind of stuff. Yesterday, with, you know, young, young people even crossing the street, and they were like, Blocking, you know, they were so drunk, I was afraid for them. And I did say, very pastorally, I said, you know, I hope that, you know, they're going to blow themselves out of their mind with all their drinking and alcohol. I hope they make it to church in the morning on Sunday. You know, you know uh, but they're probably not, and they're probably listening to me right now with the biggest hang hangover that they've ever had. Go for them. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but for me, it was like a, almost a cultural shock as a New Yorker being here all my life and seeing people hopping from bar to bar getting drunk, and they're raising money, they said, to help the poor, or oh, whatever. And I say, and there's even a name for it, you know, but don't, don't shout it out right now. There is a name for it. You know what it is, right? But I, I, I've come to the conclusion that people just don't know what to do with themselves while they wait. And we're in this period of Advent now, which is that period where there is an anticipation historically uh, for the arrival of the birth of Christ. Whatever your religion or tradition might be, there is this tradition here in this country particularly where December 25th is a moment where the incarnation happens, when God leaves his cosmic eternal abode and becomes a human being, a human baby. So this is anticipation, this gift giving and gift receiving and lights going up and all of that. So today what I'd like to do is follow me as I, I want to preach a sermon entitled, While We Wait. What should we do or not do while we wait? Because it isn't yet December 25th, and if you're very Latino like me, you're anticipating January 6th for Three Kings Day. You know, whatever date marks your anticipation of the arrival of, of, of the baby Jesus, uh, we're in that period now. Is it the mistletoe? Is it more than that? Is it the office party, or is it more than that? Is it giving and receiving gifts, or is it more than that? is in finding out who has the tallest tree uh, in my family, or is it more than that? And I think we need to have a posture, a position, a way of being. And I'd like to share with you some insights based on the, uh, on the, the parable of the ten virgins. 
I didn't get any reaction. Maybe, is it the word ten or is it the word virgin? <laughs> Based on the ten virgins. And the parables are interesting. Parables are simply teachings that the Lord used from everyday life to bring about a moral, moral confrontation. If you, if you read Jesus was, and, and you read a scripture and you study the life of the Lord, he was a master in, in teaching through parables. You know, the parable that, we, that I like referring to a lot, one of the parables of the kingdom, the one where he was, uh, the, 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 the farmer went out and he's casting the seeds and they fall on different places in the ground. And what Jesus used to do, he would observe the context and based on what he was seeing, he would use that to be able to bring a spiritual teaching through parables. And parables, just as this one that, I, that I'm going to share with you today from Matthew 25, parables divided the crowd. You didn't, once you heard the parable and you reached to its conclusion, you had to fall on one side or the other of the teaching. There was no sitting on the fence. That's what parables did. And Jesus was a master. I suspect, and you've heard me say this before, and I just want to repeat it briefly, that if the Lord were teaching today, he would use things that we experience every single day to bring a, a spiritual dimension or a spiritual aspect or angle to that thing. Boy, I would love to hear Jesus tell us a parable about bike lanes. Or elevators. Or waiting online at Pathmark. Or road rage. Don't put your head down now. Or tolls. Because he would use common things to bring about teachings. But let's go back a little bit and look at this parable because it is a fascinating one. And I want to just unpack it uh, with you today so that we can learn, we can all learn together, myself included, what should I do? What is the charge for me as we wait, as we anticipate the arrival of baby Jesus and in, in the way we traditionally celebrate here on the 25th. In the parable, I, I want to read it in segments and then give you some insights. And this parable is, before I go, go into the reading and, and some of the insights, uh, many biblical uh, uh, scholars uh, aren't sure what is the purpose of this parable. What is the idea behind it? That doesn't mean there aren't biblical implications or meanings that come out of it. They are. But some have had difficulty kind of crafting and understanding. And, and I see preachers here and some Bible students here. We all have opinions about it, but there is no concrete one, this is the plan. One thing that is not debatable is that this parable, when it's talking about waiting for the bridegroom, the bridegroom is the anticipated arrival of Jesus. That's what it's about. So it fits into our um, what happens while we wait right now. And as we're anticipating the incarnation of Christ, the celebration of the incarnation of Christ, what should our attitude be? Let's read it together in segments so that I can share with you some insights. Verse 1 of Matthew 25, it says this, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I want to stop at the first few words. At that time the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying here that what I'm going to share with you right now, this story is important because it is a comparative of what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven would be uh, uh, manifested uh, for you. It is not a declaration of religion, but rather it is a, a, a declaration, a definition of relationship. And you'll see that in a few moments. And the way I define kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, let's use those words, uh, those phrases interchangeably right now. Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God for the sake of, of everyone's understanding of where I'm going with this. is simply meant the rule of God or the rule of Jesus over our lives. Anyone here ever got angry? Anyone here know somebody that's not telling the truth right now that is here right now? <laughs> right? Anyone ever, ever felt or thought about reacting in a way that was not, what would Jesus do in this moment? No. Two hands? No. You ever want to chop somebody's head off, knock somebody over, tell somebody off, give somebody a piece of my man, read the hand? What stops us from telling them what we think what stops us from doing what we're anticipating, we would like to do the scenario that's upstairs <clears throat> in our brain. It's not our physical strength. It's not your wonderful beauty. 
What stops us is the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us that puts the brakes on uncontrolled uh, emotion. Because oftentimes when we do things without thinking it through, which we don't think it through because we're angry, so when we do something simply out of an impulse of emotion, when we get to the other side of the incident, we're going to regret we reacted that way. Amen. We've all said words we would like to take back. We've all thought things that we would like not to think. We've all had reactions. And what happens is you have a human reaction, inclination toward moving forward because that's, you know, somebody hits me, I'm going to hit them back. There's some Christians that love that thing about, you know, put the other cheek. They like that. Hit me and I'll hit you right back because it's in the Bible. Right? Hold on. What stops us from being bad and doing wrong and then feel guilty is not human resolve. It's not another a videotape of XYZ preacher. It is not some anointing or anointment over our life. None of that. It's not special shoes or special garments. It's simply the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that when we're driving and somebody cuts us off, we think it, but we don't do it. When we're at work and somebody undermines us and we want to get back and retaliate, we think it, but we don't do it because the Holy Spirit starts. So the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is actually that. It's actually the rule, if you're writing down, the rule and dominion of Jesus over my heart. Not the rule and dominion of Jesus over the church. The rule of dominion of, of, uh, of Jesus over a denomination or a philosophy or a thinking. It's the rule and dominion of Jesus over my heart. And I don't know about you, but our hearts need a lot of dominating by God. Yeah. Our hearts need a lot of control by God. I typically, when people go crazy, you know what I do? I typically pray is, Lord, grab a hold of their heart. Yeah. Don't change their mind. Grab a hold of their heart. Because where your heart, the heart is the seed of everything that comes out of our mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart speaketh the mouth, the Bible says. So the kingdom of heaven is having the rule or dominion of the Lord over my life. It isn't about singing another song, singing it on key or off key. It's simply about here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. And that's yielding to the Lord and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come rest in my life. Otherwise, we'll mess things up. We'll make things worse. So the opening phrase there in the kingdom of heaven will be like, and now he's making a comparison of what people can understand there, the ten virgins, and we're going to break it down in a moment, but it connects to us uh, today. I mean, can you say hallelujah with me for a moment? Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah with me for a moment? Hallelujah. And it says five of them were foolish and five were wise. So there was ten, five were foolish and five were In other words, five were smart and five were not smart. All right? The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. You may want to underline that when I come back to it. The wise ones, or the wise, wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was, was a long time in coming, and they all, say all with me, oh. they all became drowsy and fell asleep. As I look around the room and see some of you drowsy. And... What do we get from this? The first thing that I got from this is there was ten, five wise and five unwise. Although the verse doesn't show it, I can go into some conjecture with you as we lift the intent of the author from the book. That means that there was a choice. You could have even been five, one of the five wise ones or chosen to be one of the five not wise ones. You could have chosen to be one of the five that got it together or chosen to be one of the five that doesn't know what they're doing. The issue of choice. No one makes you do what you do. You choose to do it. The difference is that adults and mature people accept the consequences and results of their choices. Immature people blame it on somebody else. Not me. It was Billy, it was Booby, it was Bobby, it was whatever, but not me. All of us have before us an element of the creation of the deity of God in our lives, and that is that we have the power to choose. And God is so secure within himself, his cosmic self, that he allows us to have that element in our lives. God can make us do whatever he wants us to do, whatever he wants for us to do. But God decides to give you, and I want you to understand this, because everything in your life that happens, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't come 
and knock off that uh, strawberry cheesecake out of your hand because it's going to raise your cholesterol level. You know what in your head, but you take, and I'm guilty too. I'll take two slices of the strawberry cheesecake and just smear it all over my skin because I love it so much. Right? And then, Lord, help me to bring my cholesterol level down. Right? The, the words that come out of our mouth, we make a choice, and I'm, and I'm pushing this, and, and, and truth, are you ready for truth? Are you really ready for truth? Are you really, you know what truth is? Truth tells you how it be. What you do with that truth is your business. But truth, this morning when you got up, you confronted truth. You got all spiffy and ready to go. And then you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I look pretty good. You don't look good. I look skinny. I'm not getting old. Truth, mirror, reflects. What you do with that information is a whole different ballgame. I, I like saying, I look good for 63. You might say other things. I'm not losing my hair. I still have some. You, 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 I don't have more wrinkles. Some people stop counting birthdays. They stop counting birthdays. They don't count anymore because I don't want to know. Well, why not? You're seasoned. You're mature. You're, you're, you have more value. Come on, the older people who can say hallelujah. The 20 and under don't say anything, but the older, you know what I'm talking about. Gray hair is distinguished. Any gray hair people in here want to say hallelujah? We think, we think, we think truth is to make me feel good. No, truth confronts you with the facts, Jack. What you do with it is choice. You don't have to pick up that other cigarette. You don't have to answer that call from somebody that is not your wife or husband. You don't have to entertain the conversation with somebody that's going to... You ever talk with somebody, you say hello, and after five minutes after the hellos and the pleasantries, the conversation goes down the tubes real quickly. You have a choice to stay there or to go somewhere else. We were traveling recently, and an old man, 84 years old, he should be embarrassed of himself. He was, he's that, you know, everybody, in three minutes, people tell me their whole life story. It's amazing. This man, I didn't even tell him I was a pastor. I'm standing, we well, was sitting next to him, and he's talking to me and having a great time, and he's telling me, you know, I'm 84 years old, and I was married for 55 years. This is literally in about 90 seconds. My wife passed away, and I've been married now two years, and I'm here vacationing with my kids and my family, and I love it, and I love it. And he's telling me, I said, oh, that's wonderful, sir. That's absolutely fantastic. That's great, you know, and opening the conversation, questions I give him, because he wants to share, obviously. Has no notion that I'm a pastor. Within a few moments, he says, you know, we were at the beach yesterday with my whole family, and, you know, my family went away. He says, look at this. And he opens up, this is an 84-year-old man, opens up his phone, starts showing me pictures of half-dressed individuals. <laughs> I had a choice. Listen to me. Listen to me. I had a choice. Either continue to be pleasant and diplomatic with the gentleman or stop the conversation. So I cross my legs this way. I look the other way, and we stopped talking. I didn't, no rudeness. You say you should have told them off. No, no rudeness. But I'm not going to entertain the conversation anymore. You have a choice. When you're at work for your Christmas party, you have a choice. When people are going out and everybody's going, you have a choice. And you have to be prepared with your choices to let people, to, to have people uh, speak of you, even badly, because you're not participating in this stuff. Oh, come on. I don't want to be any clearer because I'm seeing a lot of new people here. They don't know me yet. They'll know me soon. But you know what I'm talking about. You have a choice. It isn't that the devil showed up. No, it's that you did not demonstrate maturity to say, no, I'm crossing my legs. I'm not having this conversation anymore. Yes. Yes. It's on you. But that comes through the work of the kingdom of God inside of your heart. So Jesus starts opening up. And the first thing is that, church, you and I, watch this. You may want to write my first point. You, may, you, you and I have the ability to choose or not choose foolishness. Foolishness. They could have been part of the five wise or part of the five foolish. And oftentimes in life, we end up making choices and stay close to people that are not like-minded, people that don't add value to your, to your life. I'm not saying here don't have conversations with people. Talk to people. I talk to everybody that wants to talk to me when I'm walking, whatever. But there are, I'm talking about people that will take you into while you wait for the presence of God's blessing over your life. Don't choose foolishness. Don't hang out with foolishness. Come on, we all have that cousin, that uh, family member, that person that's not even a blood member, but it feels like a family member, that every time you have the conversation, it goes down the same path all the time. In five minutes, it's gone down the toilet. Now, you have to choose which of you two are, are, are the wise one if you entertain the conversation. 
While we wait, don't entertain the foolishness. I already told you about some foolishness. I don't understand this thing about yesterday. Hopping from bar to bar to raise money. I don't, and you say, oh, pastor, you're being so legalistic. Well, judge me. Judge me. I'm just telling you that we sometimes have to draw the line of where we're going. To, I just don't understand the foolishness. I get the Christmas tree. I get the mistletoe. I get the gift giving. I get that. I get the parties at work and at home. I get that killing the pig and let's have a panita and a rice and whatever. I get it. I get it. I get it. But there's some things that don't make any sense. And if you want to live out your purpose in God as you anticipate the arrival of the, of, the, of the birth of Christ and even move on further for the start of the new year, you have to stay close to like-minded people, people that would enrich your life and move you forward, not people that will, uh, will want to hear your story as a form of entertainment. You can tell a lot about a people by the relationships they maintain. You can tell a lot about, in Spanish there's a phrase that says, tell me who you're hanging out with and I'll tell you who you are. That's how it directly translates. Tell me who you're hanging out with, and I'll tell you who you are. You want to know somebody, look who are the friends. Who are the people looking them up? Who are the people that they're entertaining? We've got to choose. We cannot choose foolishness while we wait. Well, this Christmas is about Christ. Christmas is about Lord's, uh, God's promise uh, to redeem us. Uh, Christmas is about God's love being manifested and made tangible around us. That's what the Christmas season is about. We need to choose our friends judiciously. Not everyone that wants to be your friend can add value to your life and vice versa. There are some people you cannot speak value into their lives. Being with them is not going to help you. The other thing that I see in this first few verses that we read is that we have to be careful while we wait not to be half prepared. Not to be half prepared. Don't half prepare. It says that the women had, look at this, you're going you're gonna to like this. Maybe you're not going to like it because it's true. <laughs> Five had their lamps and oil. Five had their lamps and no oil. There are some people that look real spiritual and religious. There's nothing behind the facade, but they look good. There are some people that speak good, but their lives does not represent at all the values of Christ in their life, does not represent the kingdom of God. And we're so nice that we end up choosing them and connecting with them and thinking that they can be, be, be careful. Don't get fooled by the facade. Don't get fooled by what you just see on the outside. A parrot can be taught to speak English or French or German, nice words and curse words too. So sometimes we get so blown away by what we see on the outside, sometimes we can get fooled by what we see and also when you see something that shines outside and on the other side is completely empty and void, please don't judge everybody else by that. Please don't. Don't go halfway. The women, they're the five that were foolish. They look wise, but they were foolish. They look prepared, but they were foolish. They looked ready to receive uh, the bride, the, the, bride, the groom. They looked ready, but they were not Prepare. Church, we need to be careful as we wait to be half ready. We need to be completely committed and ready uh, to honor the Lord every time we, we, we go before him and every day that we live. Having a lamp with no oil is like having no lamp at all. Having a lamp with no oil is like having... Now, the other thing is that you'll see it in the verse in a few moments. The ones that didn't have oil when... when, when the gig went down and it was time to uh, receive the groom, they started blaming somebody. Give us some of your oil. Well, give us some of your oil. Get your own oil. Wait, I'm, I'm going too fast. That's the other Because <laughs> that's typically what happens. People don't do anything for themselves, and then they expect you to go and, and vouch for them. Church, here's the teaching. Anything that's half done is not complete. Make sure that your life is complete. Be the best man that you can be. Be the best woman that you can be. Be the best human being that you can be. Be the best person that you can be. Work at you and let other people work on them. Sometimes we want to fix others because we have transference and counter-transference issues for those psychologists that are in the room. We have to realize that you need to take care of your own stuff and let God work out his stuff with other people, with, with the stuff of other people. Don't have prepared. A lamp is not enough. You need to have oil. You need to have something behind. You need to have something behind your words. 
Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah with me for a moment? But you know what? Half prepared uh, infers the following, and that is that we have to prepare. Preparation is the foundation for success. You want to get things in life, you've got to sweat it. There's things you have to do. You can't just, which takes me to the next point. It says that they were half prepared, but the next point that I want to bring to you is don't sleep on, until everything is ready. Don't sleep until everything is ready. It says in the text that the ten of them got drowsy and they all fell asleep. Now, the ones that were righteous and doing the right thing, they had lamps and oils, they were tired, they fell asleep, but they were ready. The ones that were not prepared, that they had the lamp but no oil, they were tired, but they went to sleep. They shouldn't have gone to sleep. Why? Because they weren't ready. I really believe if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. There's, there's stuff that we can help you with, and the society, our culture can help you with. Some people just don't like working. They like sleeping. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to fulfill. You're looking in the mirror now. You may look wonderful. You may look like a rock. Like me. <laughs> you got to work. You got to work on your stuff. You got to get up in the morning. Nothing shows up in the bed to, that, that you're sleeping in uh, regarding your purpose. You have to get And sometimes there are periods in your life when sleep becomes a luxury. When a loved one is sick, you stop eating, you stop sleeping just to take care of that loved one. When someone is going through a situation that no one else can help them and all you, need, all you can do is be with them uh, during their trial and tribulation, you don't think about sleeping. You do what needs to be done. And I think sometimes we just live too comfortably. We just have to realize that sleep is a blessing and it's a luxury, but there's some times that some, I, I, I have to sleep eight hours, otherwise I have an attitude. Maybe you need to have an attitude for a little while so you can mop up your life and get rid of some of the stuff that you're carrying with. Oh, come on, is that too much for you? Because oh, we expect somebody else to fix it for us. No, you, there are things that you've got to fix yourself. I, I don't know, I, I, when I go get my hair cut, right, marvelous sister from our church. She does our hair, and then when I leave, I end up fixing it the way I like it. It's not that she doesn't know. She knows her stuff. She knows how heads like mine are generally combed. But there's just, am I just the only one? Uh, some people, how many people here eat? Eat food. Huh? Everybody here, right? Some people like just put it all on the plate. Lettuce, tomatoes, rice, beans, dessert, the soda, coca cola Put it all on one plate. Me, use ten plates. Let me put as, even I go crazy with coffee. The guys sometimes get me coffee, and I'm, I'm just, I'm difficult. I admit I'm difficult. Because there's just a certain way, and there's very few people that know my crazy idiosyncrasies when it comes to caffeine and coffee. But it's, it's not that you're wrong, it's just that I like a certain way. Come on, you get up in the morning and you, there's a style that you have. Some people brush their teeth first, and some people brush their teeth when they're leaving the house. They're already dressed up. Some people comb their hair first. Yeah? It's just a matter of your preference and your style. My point is this, get to know yourself. Don't sleep until you're ready to go. Don't judge yourself on other people. Do it on your own, but, but just make it happen. When something is important, you make arrangements in your life, and really sleep becomes irrelevant. When I was in school and 10 years ago, I already graduated when my, uh, my final degree 10 years ago, and, it, it, and I made a conscious choice, and I understood that the rigors of seminary work was going to be mind-blowing, Tons of books to read, stuff to do. So here's what I did. I decided the only way I can carve the time in my life was to sleep less. Huge sacrifice. But I knew it was only temporary. I, only, I knew. So what I did is I, I cut down. And at the beginning of the day, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I would be down here in the office studying. And then at the end of the day, past midnight, for a period of time, especially at the, at the last uh, eight months, uh, when I was writing my dissertation, it was really, really crazy. But you probably didn't even notice the blip. I was still preaching and ministering and carrying around the church. But I realized that I had to, with the help of the staff that we had, in order for me to make it happen, I had to make those choices and decisions. We want microwave success. We want, can you give me a pill so I don't have to do a 21-day fast? Just give me a pill. 
and it'll qualify before God. No, there are things that require blood, sweat, and tears. And things of value you just have to sacrifice for. And it says that they all fell asleep, and they fell asleep not ready. When something important is important, sleep becomes irrelevant. Stay awake until the task is done, even tired. And what I mean by that, let me just bring it further, because I want to explain. Some of you are looking at me with one eye already. L listen, what that means is learn to manage your time. Manage your time. You are the master of your time. I need more time. You don't need more time. You just need self-control. That's all. Cut, you know, 25% of your Facebook time, and you have time there to write five dissertations. Yeah, it's true. Of selecting your clothing and going, whatever it is that you do, and you'll have time to do it. Manage your time, especially when there is a, a task or a goal that's going to enrich your life. Don't sleep on that until everything is ready. Study anyone that is successful, and you will discover a person that has learned to manage their sleep and their time. Now, it is a blessing. We like to eat. We like to sleep. But we have to be able to manage that, not the other way around. So while we wait, don't choose foolishness. While we wait, don't prepare halfway. Don't half prepare. While we wait, don't sleep until everything is ready. But look at the next thing I see on here, reading verses 6 through 10. At midnight, the cry ran out, rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come to meet him. Then all, say all with me. All. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give me some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both, of us, for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Look at this crazy scenario. This is crazy. Five had it all together. Lamp, oil, and they were rested. They were ready to go. The other five had lamps, no oil. They didn't prepare, but they were also dressed and ready to go, but they weren't prepared. The bell rings. Now they show up to the scenario. Now the ones that did not prepare go to the ones that prepared and say, we don't have. Now stop. Put pause. pause hit pause. Hit pause. Pause. Why didn't they prepare? Why weren't they ready? Because they did not prepare. Because they did not manage their time. Because they put a facade of a bride virgin ready to go, when in reality, behind the scenes, there was nothing there. Now, we still have it on pause. Now they wanted the people that were ready to take care of them. Look, look, look at my fourth point. My fourth point is this. Don't be an endless enabler. Stop being an endless enabler. An enabler is someone that just provides a resource or a pathway for somebody else. And you know, you help somebody the first time because you're gracious, you're evangelistic, you want to be Christ with flesh on. You help them the second time. But when they come knocking on you the third, fourth, and fifth time, the neighbor comes knocking over. I didn't get to go to the store. Can you give me sugar? Sure. The next day, I didn't get to go to the store. Give me salt. I didn't get to the store. A dozen eggs. By that time, you're an enabler. If you're giving them sugar, and they're coming back for salt, and the third time they're coming back for eggs, the fourth time they're going to come for bacon and ham, you are an... You're not helping them. You have this false image in your mind that you're being generous, kind, evangelistic, loving, when in reality is you're feeding into their dysfunction. Let me give you something closer to home. You ready for truth? He doesn't always hit me. It's only when he gets mad. Why do you take the chairs away when I go on vacation? Not your chairs. <laughs> he, only hit, he only yells at me when, when, he, when, when he gets mad. That's all. Well, either you keep saying that for the rest of your life, or you tell that joker, you go up and be a man, because I ain't putting up with this anymore. If you allow that to continue, you're an enabler. Got quiet here. Got, that family, we all have that family member. They work, but they never have a dime. 
They have a job, but they never always come in to get, to get. They never give. You have that family, and you love them. Oh, no, because it's my family member, and mom told me to take care of them and take care. That's cool. That's fine. But if all you're doing is giving, and they're not participating in their own development, you are an enabler. If the five wise women that were ready with their lamps and their oil gave those that did not prepare oil, gave it to them, they were becoming enablers. But what did they tell them? You didn't prepare, but why don't you just go now? You know what the answer would have been? No, but we don't have time. That's right. It's your fault. Yeah, I'm going to give him some money. I don't know if he's using it for drugs again, but it's a, I'm giving him money. Come on. You know where that's going. Oh, a lot, a lot of people just bob their heads now, huh? You, you know where it's going. You know where it's going. You know what's happening behind the scenes. And admit, part of denial is so destructive that denial doesn't allow us to find the pathway that God has for our lives. And we say, no, not me. Yes, you. And this parable, I think, uh, confronts us with this truth and this reality. Uh, the definition of an enabler is someone who feeds the behavior of another. This is not about sharing. And I'm not saying don't share. Share, give, bless. But when you have a repeat, it's like the person. There's 52 Sundays in the year, and every time we make an altar call for salvation, the same person comes again to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They got baptized five years ago, and now they want to get baptized again. And the next five years, they want to get baptized again. You've got to understand that they're, we're becoming enablers. If so-and-so preaches, I'll show up. That's enabling. What if so-and-so doesn't show up? If they sing my favorite song, Read my beautiful verse. If I can leave feeling good, truth is not about feeling good. 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 It's about showing you a mirror. I would not go back to a doctor that found something on the x-ray and says, oh, Mr. Rivera, uh, come back in three months. I said, why? Doctor, what are you seeing? I don't know, I can't read x-rays, so I wouldn't go back to a doctor like that. Oh, the blood work. You need to go back in three weeks. Why? See, I'm the worst patient because I ask questions. I like you, doctor, but why? No, 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 don't go. Let's go, why? Why are you doing this? This is God's masterpiece you're touching. I'm giving you permission to touch God's creation here. What's going on? But some of us would rather go with, I'd rather go, tell me the truth. It'll hurt, it'll upset, it'll be horrible for a moment, but you know what? We're grown people, we'll get over it. We'll get over it, you'll get over it. There'll be pain, there'll be suffering. Say hallelujah, some of you are looking at me real strange right now. Must be getting home. Don't be the endless enabler. It's not about sharing, it's about someone not preparing adequately, then trying to make you feel bad about his or her self-imposed situation. They feel bad about it. They should, and they want to make you feel bad, bad about it, too. Uh, you you, you got to realize it. Be, we have to be grown up. Somebody grown up, don't raise your hand. We've got to be grown up to our stuff. That's all. Own up to our stuff. And stop expecting from a, an individual a situation that will not deliver on those expectations. The worst thing is to find out afterwards the truth when you could have known all along. And then the other thing that comes out of this, listen to this closely. This is a little bit crazy, but it's biblical. There are some blessings, say some blessings with me. There are some blessings, say some blessings with me. There are some blessings that are just for you. Watch this. There are some blessings that are just, for, not for the public, there are some annoying things in this church that are just for this church. There are some annoying things in other places that are just for those places. Some people think that Brooklyn Tabernacle is, has a, an anointing of music for the choir, Grammy Award winning. That's true, anointing. But you know what their, their ethos is, the DNA of, of uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle? Their Tuesday prayer service. Yes. Unique. Can't get enough people. The seats are all taken. But we think it's the choir. Everyone has a blessing and an anointing and a configuration, a cosmic configuration that is just for them. Look at this. The five women said, no, this is our oil. The five wise ones. We can't share our oil. 
with you. You have to get your own oil. Now watch this. This is a, this is a parable of the kingdom, for those of you that study parables. It's a parable of the kingdom. It takes it to a, di a different level. Because again, the bridegroom is Jesus, and, in, and later on, as we're going to get to the conclusion shortly, in the next hour and a half, we'll get to the conclusion, you'll see that, 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 that it's the Lord speaking in, in, in connotation here or in context for this, um, uh, um, the bridegroom. Uh, we have to realize, church, that uh, there are blessings that are for you, not to be shared with anyone else. Specific, I believe in heaven that there are blessings with your name on. Shirley Caesar sings that song. It is so true. Specifically made for you in your situation and your context. Not to be shared. Now that doesn't mean don't share the blessing. I think we should share blessings in general. Don't boast about them, but share with individuals. But understand that there's certain oils in this case that have been prepared just for you. And if you share it with somebody else, uh, the, the, the second pastor of this church, Pedro Rosario, <clears throat> he used to tell him, I remember he used to say it so often from the pulpit. He was one of my mentors. Got on to be with the Lord now. And he used to say, don't let someone else prepare your worship environment. You work it out yourself. Don't come in 15 minutes after the service started. Oh, the blessing is over there. Bless me. Ta-da. No, you have to work your own relationship and praise with the Lord. You have to work, work on your own worship environment with him. We can worship corporately, but as we come before the Lord, there are some unique things that are just for you. Let me recapitulate and get to the last point. Don't choose foolishness. While we wait, don't half prepare. While we wait, don't sleep until, unless everything is ready to go. Number four, while we wait, don't be an endless enabler. Look at verses 11, 12, and 13. And with this, I'll close. It says in the text, later the others also came. And this is now, the ones that came now are the ones that did not have oil. They were not ready. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord. Now remember what I told you in this parable. Some scholars don't know the exact meaning or intent, but one thing is known for sure, and that is that the reference here to the bridegroom arriving or the bridegroom in this story, in this par parable, is a reference to Jesus. So they say, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us, because the door had been shut, as we read in verse 10. But he replied, this is one of the saddest phrases that I find in Scripture. It says, truly, I tell you. Can I teach you just for a moment? When you see the phrase, truly, I tell you, in the New Testament, it's usually rendered that way. That means that what is to follow is not, you can't change it, you can't alter it, you can't have a committee vote on it, you can't have a repeal, you can't have a recount. It just be. It's telling you when it says, truly, the next statement is truth, is fact, whether you like it or not, it is. And what does he say? The sad, one of the saddest phrases you can find in Scripture, and I hope you never hear this, it says, truly I tell you, I don't know you. That's a sad statement. Simply because they did not manage their time. Simply because they hung around with foolishness. Simply because they were sleeping when they should have been working and getting ready. Simply because they were seeking somebody to bail them out and be their enabler. They disqualified themselves from entering into the joy of the bridegroom. And the bridegroom had to state, I do not know you. What's the fifth point then, Pastor Mark? The fifth point is, listen to me, my brothers and sisters, beautiful family, I love you so much. Don't be a stranger. You've got to be in it to be blessed. You've got to be involved. You can't do it long distance. You've got to be involved. This coming year, you've got to make a commitment in your life. While we wait, but even taking it further, not to be a stranger. Maybe one of the most difficult things you can hear a friend tell you is that when you see them and they say, boy, I haven't seen you a long time, stranger. What they're really saying is, you know, you haven't been hanging out with me. That's what they're saying. We miss you. It's a sarcastic way of saying I miss you, but they say it nonetheless. Don't be a stranger. You have to be present to enjoy the blessings of the Lord. They needed to be involved. Now they were cast out simply because they made choices that were not wise. Lack of preparation makes you unrecognizable. Oh, that's horrible. I do not know you. I never want to hear that. I never want you to hear that. I want the Lord to declare good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the small things. Enter into the goodness of the Lord. That's what I want you to hear. 
But we have to realize, church, that while we wait, we cannot be strangers. It isn't about, I mean, enjoy the tree, enjoy all that stuff, enjoy the gift giving and the gift receiving. Go to Radio City Music Hall, all that stuff, fantastic, wonderful. When the snow comes, you know, get a sleigh and go to Central, do all that stuff, that's great. But don't be a stranger to the manger. Don't be a stranger to the manger. Don't be a stranger to the feet of Jesus. Don't be a stranger to the purposes that God has over your life. Don't be a stranger to the burdens God has placed already on your shoulders that need to be fulfilled. You've got to do it. Pastor Ian and I were away for a little while, and we enjoyed our time away, but we missed worshiping the Lord here together. We worshiped. We were together. We, we did our, our time together listening to preaching. But there's something about being here that does it for us, that helps, that soothes, that lifts up. Don't be a stranger. Don't hear about how good the service was. Be here and make it good. Don't hear about the fantastic thing God did. And we have a great schedule for you the rest of this month and into the new year. Don't hear about how great. Oh, I wasn't able to do the 21-day fast this year, but next year. No, no, no. Do it this time. Do it this time. Make a commitment. Don't be a stranger. Because I, and let me speak to you prophetically for a moment. I believe that this coming year for our church is going to be probably the most, because we've been so far into the valley over the last 18 months, the only way that we can go is the blessing of the Lord lifting us up. Uh, because there's been so much brokenness in your life, the only way is the mending power of the Holy Spirit to lift you up into the mountaintops. Because we've been hanging around and being uh, some by choice and not by choice in pain and in sickness and in separation and in, in, and in despair, uh, that what God has for us is tremendously... In fact, the, this is the antithesis, if you will. The, the, not the antithesis. The, 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 the anti-room. The anti-room of what God is going to have. It has already for us. Prepare for us. But don't be a spectator waiting to hear what happens. Be a participant. Be present. I believe the turnaround, and I'm not just saying this because I don't, I don't flow this way, but I'm saying it because I believe it, and I know it's going to happen. I believe that what God has in store for us, starting from the very beginning as we close out the year and start the new year and step into the, or past the threshold of what God has over our lives, is going to be mind-blowing. I believe you will be freed of addictions. I believe you will be freed of sickness. I believe you will find peace in God. I believe relationships will be restored. I believe God will deliver you from those things that have been haunting you. I really believe that. But you got to be present. We can't send anointing oil over the internet. A card will be nice when you receive it, but there's nothing like being here. And I'm not making a commercial here about being here. I'm telling you, this is the way it works, even for me. You got to be in it. You got to be involved. And I want to encourage you don't be a stranger. Make a priority in your life that you will never hear those words I do not know you. The Bible says very clearly that today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Don't put it off. Today. Why don't we stand in the sanctuary?